Hey everyone, this is lecture 7.1. In this one, we're going to be talking about suicide. Uh, so, uh, as with other uh, highly triggering topics, uh, there this one's pretty heavy. Uh, we're going to be talking about suicide, high-risk sex acts. Additionally, we'll be talking about self-harm, including uh, cutting behavior among teens. Uh, so, we'll. Our agenda for this lecture will be talking about mental health resources, uh, basic suicide statistics, a few classic theories on suicide, uh, phenomena similar to suicide, and then uh, stigma as associated with suicide. Uh, if you are somebody that uh, is triggered by these issues, there are a number of resources uh, for you to check out. Uh, the 988 Suicide uh, Crisis Lifeline, uh, which operates just like 911 does. You just go onto a, any phone and you dial 988-SEND, uh, and they will uh, get you connected there. Uh, additionally, uh, Adult Mental Health Services, known as ADAMH in uh, Franklin County, uh, can also help you out there. Uh, and then specifically at Ohio State, uh, Counseling and Consultation Services also offer uh, mental health resources for people who uh, have troubles in this regard. Uh, and there are some more uh, issues there, uh, as, long as, as well as the crisis text line uh, that you can just send text messages to if you need to. So let's talk about some basic statistics surrounding suicide. Statistics on suicide are not always reliable. A large part of this has to do with stigma associated with suicide. Uh, when people commit suicide, uh, they, their friends and family members do not necessarily talk about it. And some suicides might appear to be accidents while they are in reality suicides. Um, traditionally, uh, suicide rates are higher in urban areas. Uh, but suicide rates are higher today in rural areas than they were in the past. Um, additionally, a suicide rate is higher among whites than blacks in the United States. Early sociologists, uh, Emil Durkheim uh, specifically, found that Protestants have higher suicide rates than Catholics. And then both Protestants and Catholics had higher suicide rates than Jews. Uh, we will discuss all of that more later in uh, this lecture. Uh, men then are more likely to kill themselves than women. But attempted suicide, also known as parasuicide, rates are higher among women than men. Uh, in that regard, uh, the male v female, uh, what we call suicide completion rate, uh, largely has to do with uh, the methods men uh, choose to commit suicide as opposed to women. Uh, the fact of the matter is that us men uh, tend to think we are uh, far uh, harder to kill than we actually are, so uh, we tend to pick um, I suppose what you could call more violent modes of suicide, uh, such as uh, shooting oneself in the head. Uh, in uh, the United States, suicide rates tend to rise with increasing age. So a younger person is far less likely than an older person to commit suicide. Men are more likely to use lethal instruments, such as firearms, as I just alluded to. And divorced persons have the highest suicide rates, while married people have the lowest suicide rates. Single individuals are somewhere in between uh, divorced people and married people in that regard. Findings on the relationship between social class and suicide are contradictory. They are uh, what you could say all over the place. There aren't really clear patterns surrounding uh, social class and suicide. Uh, so as a phenomena, uh, suicide has many conceptions surrounding it, and those conceptions have been present the entire time we've been studying them as sociologists. The reality of the matter is that depression, which we often think of surrounding suicide, uh, is a risk factor for suicide, but it is not the cause of suicide. Uh, so people don't commit suicide, quote, because they are depressed, 
uh, they happen to be depressed and they also commit suicide. It's, it's a risk factor like many other risk factors. Due to these understandings then, suicide was one of the first social phenomena tied to, uh, studied by sociologists. Emil Durkheim posited that suicide was driven by what are called social forces that exist outside of the individual. So for example, gravity is a social force uh, that causes items to fall through the toward the center of a planet, while peer pressure is a social force that encourages teens to maybe uh, start smoking. Uh, and uh, at the time of Durkheim studies in the early 1900s, suicide was perceived as being an intensely selfish act. That's culturally how suicide was perceived. So, Durkheim posited, if social forces existed, they would exist even in extremely isolated uh, individuals. It would serve as powerful proof if, the, if a person committed the highly individualistic act of suicide, if you could find that social forces caused someone to commit that highly individualistic act, then it would prove that social forces do indeed exist. That's the better way of saying it. Durkheimian suicide theory is based on two major principles, that of social integration and social regulation. Social integration involves people attaching themselves to groups, and then social regulation involves individuals being coercively regulated into that group. And based on these two major principles, he divided human beings well, he divided suicide cases typically into four groups. Thus, most suicides can be put into one of four broad categories. Uh, the egoistic suicide, in which the individual has inadequate social integration. The altruistic suicide, in which the individual has excessive social integration. The anomic suicide, in which the individual has inadequate social regulation. And then the fatalistic individual, in which they have excessive social regulation. Uh, these classifications are primarily used to under, underside suicide. This is one of those sociological theories that is best used to explain a very specific phenomena and doesn't really apply to most other human behavior. The egoistic suicide, uh, in this case, the individual feels themselves to be much more important than they actually are. Um, you could tie this in with a uh, concept surrounding what's known as narcissism. Uh, the individual could lead, this could lead the egoistic individual uh, to, um, to suicide when they do actually fail. So because they think they are the most important person in the world, and thus if they fail, the whole world is going to fail. That's kind of their mindset. Uh, if the individual has achieved great things in the past, then their encore anxiety, uh, their uh, inability to do more than the amazing thing could cause suicide uh, because they feel they can't do that again. Uh, many examples of this included suicides during uh, what was called a, the Black Friday stock market crash that caused the Great Depression. Uh, many uh, people uh, committed suicide by, by jumping out windows uh, on that day uh, in New York City in the 1920s, if I remember correctly. Altruistic suicide, then, is caused when an individual feels that the world will be better if they kill themselves, and this is relatively rare in modern American society. Uh, examples of this could be uh, a soldier who throws themselves on a grenade to help other people, uh, so-called uh, suti or sati uh, suicide behavior among uh, traditional Indian wives throwing themselves on their husband's funeral pyre. Um, obviously, that is tied in to concepts of uh, gender and patriarchy as well. Uh, seppuku, uh, the honor suicide expected of a de disgraced Japanese feudal warrior. And then the kamikaze suicide in which pilots uh, specifically um, flew their planes into um, uh, boats at the end of World War II. 
Uh, all of these are examples of kind of a mission-driven suicide, if you were, uh, that, um, again, not super common in modern American society. Uh, another example could maybe be uh, somebody who takes out a large insurance policy, uh, knowing that their family will be better off and they kill themselves uh, so that their family gets that money. Uh, that also could be an example of um, suicide. I mean, of altruistic suicide. Uh, anomic suicide occurs uh, when individuals have abs actually absolute control over their situation. And this is, uh, that kind of independence and freedom is something that is uh, often celebrated in our society, but uh, the anomic individual um, highlights uh, how that can be really bad. Uh, thus, if nobody can tell them what to do, or at least they perceive that nobody can tell them what to do, uh, then um, they can be more prone to committing suicide. Uh, anomie is defined as the social condition and force of being without social regulation. This is uh, often uh, alluded to when we talk about the so-called 27 Club, in which uh, young celebrities have a certain tendency uh, to um, do increasingly risky acts, uh, including but not limited to uh, drug abuse. And uh, in doing that, uh, they, they do that behavior because they don't think that anyone can actually tell them what to do, that they have total control of their lives. And in that case, that lack of accountability doesn't rein an individual in when they may actually, um, it, that, that would be critical to actually saving their lives. Fatalistic suicide then uh, is the result of excessive social regulation. So the fatalistic person feels that they have no actual control over their situation. Teens who are oppressively controlled by their parents may feel and get into a fatalistic mode. Uh, depending on specific situation then, uh, fatalistic individuals may uh, do what is called revenge suicide. If they kill themselves to punish the person they perceive to be regulating them. Um, in the film Dead Poets Society, uh, one of the characters uh, killed them themselves because they felt that they could not escape the overbearingness of uh, their father. Uh, that is uh, a pretty good example there. You can probably uh, YouTube uh, search that uh, specific uh, set of scenes uh, if you don't want to watch the whole movie. If you want to watch the whole movie, Dead Poet Society is a pretty good movie. Uh, now let's look at some phenomena that are not suicide, but to the uneducated individual might appear to be suicide. There are other phenomena uh, in this area, and even if this phenomena results in a person uh, taking actions that could lead to their own death, that does not inherently mean that it is suicide itself. Autoerotic auto asphyxiation is one such example of a behavior that um, maybe was not is not intentionally meant to uh, cause death but could lead to it. Uh, the definition here being a sexual practice in which an individual combines masturbation with uh, simulated suffocation. It isn't inherently uh, related to masturbation. It could involve um, a, a sexual partner, but um, but it's, it's, it's kind of murky right there. Uh, Autoerotic asphyxiation is obviously far riskier because there isn't another person uh, there to um, actually uh, save the person if something bad should happen. Practitioners do this to supposedly achieve a more intense orgasm. However, as pointed out by Janet Brito, who is a licensed and highly qualified sex therapy specialist, Autoerotic asphyxiation is truly very risky and may lead to serious injury, including cardiac arrest, brain damage from lack of oxygen and death. So I am absolutely the kind of person to not tell people what they should and should not do sexually, but this is a, a truly very, um, it's very, very dangerous uh, of a thing. Euthanasia. 
uh, also known as assisted suicide, uh, is a healthcare procedure that is specifically designed to quickly end the life of the patient. And in places where euthanasia is legal, the patient must be suffering from a chronic, typically terminal disease. Uh, they must also be of sound mind and fully understand their situation. Um, so uh, where euthanasia does exist, uh, people who are not able to actually make sound decisions because of uh, usually mental Ill deep mental illness or maybe um, dementia of certain kinds, uh, that would not qualify someone for euthanasia. Uh, Mr. Escobar here uh, in uh, Cali, Colombia, decided to die, and he did that publicly, becoming one of the first Latin Americans to end their life without suffering from a terminal disease under a Supreme Court ruling in Colombia, and there's a link there. Uh, basically, Mr. Escobar had a very uh, painful um, breathing condition in which it was not going to lead to his death Immediately, it would have taken a very, very long time, but his quality of life was very, very low, so he decided to end his own life. The practice uh, of euthanasia is illegal, and because it is illegal, it is largely undocumented in most states. However, it should be pointed out that in Colorado, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Maine, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington, it is legal in the United States. Uh, with that said, where it is illegal, it probably still happens relatively rare, relatively uh, commonly. Uh, most commonly, uh, this will look something like uh, doctors saying to patients or uh, the caregivers of patients, be sure not to take this amount of pills over this short of a period of time, thus telling them through, through you know, innuendo that this could cause death. Uh, euth euthanasia can be very controversial. Uh, many people who do object to uh, suicide, uh, to euthanasia, sorry, uh, different things. Uh, many people who object to euthanasia do so on religious grounds. Uh, the secular debate surrounding euthanasia, so the debate not relating to religion, uh, points out that there may be, uh, with people who are candidates for euthanasia, a so-called obligation to die, wherein uh, the patient may be kind of forced into the decision to kill themselves, uh, to... Uh, kind of put the end of the suffering to their family members while uh, a actual functioning uh, euthanasia mechanic in society would exist so that people who are suffering can actually cause that to stop. Munchausen syndrome is another uh, psychological disorder that can appear to make the person uh, look like they are uh, suicidal. This may involve self-poisoning that could result in the serious illness or death of the individual. The reason somebody with Munchausen syndrome um, does these things to themselves is because it appears that, basically to get the attention of individuals. And this is not really a, a selfish uh, behavior. This is a behavior that the individual can't really help. Like most mental disorders, they, they just desperately crave that attention, and they found that making themselves sick gets them that attention. This is not to be confused with uh, what's called Munchausen by proxy syndrome, in which a caregiver makes a, their individual sick. Usually this is a parent that makes their child sick to get attention for themselves. Self-injury is another example of a behavior that looks like suicide, but or maybe potentially suicide, but it's not suicide. This is a practice in which an individual intentionally injures themselves due to psychological distress. Uh, this is most common among adolescents uh, trying to cope with powerful emotions. It is documented to be more common among uh, females, but it is absolutely also found in males. This is 
this behavior is uh, probably more common than most of us think, and it may not may or it may not be tied to severe desires for attention. Um, it could include, but not be limited to, cutting behavior. It could include burning. It could include uh, other types of self-harm. And uh, more severe cases of uh, self-injury, um, they attempt to hide their behavior. So this could be an individual, say, uh, instead of cutting themselves on their arm, they may cut themselves on their inner thigh. Uh, that obviously is, is much more dangerous, uh, especially including the fact that um, there are uh, more uh, uh, vital arteries and blood vessels in the legs than there are uh, in the arms. Uh, suicide bombers uh, are other people that appear to be um, appear to be uh, committing suicide, but the reality of the matter is, that it is a behavior different than suicide. Uh, it is, however, very similar to altruistic suicide. So I'm not gonna ask you the difference between suicide bombing and altruistic suicide. They are, they are very similar behaviors. Um, but uh, what we wanna point out here is that it may or may not be tied with religious ideology. Uh, when it is tied to religious ideology, the individual may anticipate being rewarded in the afterlife for their actions that are causing their death. Uh, the term homicide bomber, I, um, I point out here uh, because it was a propaganda term, it was an American propaganda term used to discredit the motivation of suicide bombers in the Middle East during the uh, early 2000s regarding Palestinian suicide bombers. Um, there, there is really no social scientific phenomena known as homicide bomber. That is specifically a propaganda term. And I want to, I put that here to point out that our perceptions of deviant behavior are absolutely linked to cultural elements that are occurring in our society at a given time. Uh, so that term homicide bomber came as a result of a lot of the cultural influence of the war on terror in the early 2000s uh, and again tied in with a lot of the misinformation tied in uh, specifically uh, with that era. Okay that is the end of this lecture. If you have any questions just let me know.